All right. All right. I think we're ready to go. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Peter Pouliot, and I work on OpenStack at Microsoft. Alessandro, I work at Cloud Base Solutions, the company doing all the integration between Microsoft Technologies and OpenStack. Great. I'm mm -hmm. so uh, pleased to have a packed house today with uh, everybody here in Tokyo. So thank you for coming out to listen to us talk. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to ask a couple questions. Uh, first off, how many people in here have already used Windows with OpenStack today? Oh, that is awesome. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't even know where to, that's a, that's a, a big house. Well, what right. was the next question? <laughs> I, I don't remember. I'm, o I'm overwhelmed by seeing that many hands raised. You, you have to, every summit we've been coming to for quite mm -hmm. a while now, we've slowly watched those hands progress. Increasing, so, yeah. yeah. How many of you are using Hyper-V in OpenStack? Well, still progressing at yeah, least one. At least one. <laughs> awesome. I'll take it. All right. <laughs> So today, today we're going to talk about a few things regarding the technologies that we've enabled in OpenStack mm -hmm. for uh, basically the integrations that were enabled for Windows and OpenStack. So uh, specifically, we're going to start the agenda with Windows as a guest. Okay. Do you want to say two words about that screen over there? Oh, well, I I'll let you say it because that's okay, what you're yeah. doing. <laughs> so as you notice, you see those logos there. So OpenStack plus Windows equals love. Okay. So our goal here is to make sure that um, everything related to Microsoft technology and OpenStack will work together in the best possible way. So uh, together with Peter, we started up a community, which now it's already quite a few years old. Well, uh, yeah. well, from my perspective, I've yeah. been at this for well, mm. almost over four years now. Mm. Uh, we've been working together for about three and a half. Yeah, think, three and a right? half, yeah, yeah. And things are growing a lot. So we have a, a lot of people developing and working in the Nova community. We have people working in Cinder, Manila, Silometer. So all basically all the major projects have uh, people involved in it. So it's, it's great to see all the community working. And if you guys also are willing to com contribute, let's say, on every possible level from filing bugs down to documentation, down, of course, to writing code, we are more than happy to accept any, any help. A word on the agenda? Okay, to me. Yeah. So on. Windows as a guest, uh, then a little bit of information about Windows licensing in OpenStack. How many of you have absolutely clear how Windows licensing works in OpenStack? Exactly. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we can shed okay. some light for that. Heat templates today. and of course some words are for Windows hypervisors, I mean, meaning Hyper-V. So Windows as a guest. All right. So today, we can consume Windows as a guest on top of OpenStack regardless of hypervisor technology used, okay? So KVM, VMware, all those things. And we can assure that that guest experience is identical to Linux, okay? So we can take that image, feed it into Glance, and, and you should have the identical user experience for your Windows guests that you have on Linux, given the integrations that we've provided by working with CloudBase. So uh, today, if you're going to use Windows on top of any hypervisor other than Hyper-V, you're required to use a level of integration, uh, para-virtualized device driver layer. Okay, today, the, the, that layer is built into Windows. If you were to run a, let's, let's say, a Linux guest on top of Hyper-V, you would need to utilize our Linux integration services. For KVM, you're required to use the Vert.io drivers. And there's an interesting circumstance that, uh, that is uh, sort of... Uh, a byproduct of the certification process at Microsoft, which uh, adds some complexity to that Vert.io layer, Vert layer, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, with VMware, you need to use the VMware tools, and with Zen Server uh, and XCP, uh, you need to use the Zen Server tools. Okay. okay. And generally speaking, if you have Hyper-V, it just works out of the box, okay? That's a yep, great absolutely. advantage. But I just want to be clear, we support Windows on any possible hypervisor supported in OpenStack, so it doesn't have to be a Hyper-V only thing. So of course it works in an easier way at least, but any other hypervisor works. Cloud-based init, how many of you are using it? Okay. Oh, how many Where of you is? know what it is? Okay. <laughs> I think the same people. <laughs> yeah, I might be. So um, Cloud-based init is 100% Python code, okay? So and that's one another thing that we wanted to make absolutely clear from the beginning. When we started developing Cloud-based init, we wanted to make sure that any uh, DevOps familiar with cloud init was able to find a very similar environment also on Windows. So we prefer to use a, a Python code over .NET code in this case, okay? Not because there are not enough .NET developers out there, okay? But because Python is somehow 
uh, I'm the lingua franca, okay, in the moment in which it comes to, to coding, okay? So if I may add something, yeah. just, just to be clear, cloud-based init is our guest initialization layer for Windows, mm -hmm. right? So the equivalent of cloud init. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but we, um, we reached, let's say, an agreement with the cloud init community in which we merged the two projects, okay? And there's going to be a cloud init version 2, which is the merge between the two code bases, okay? So between cloud-based init and the cloud init v1. The reason why we didn't do a porting from the beginning of cloud init to Windows is because cloud init is very, very Linux specific. So it was simply impossible to do it, okay? So while cloud-based init was started from the beginning as a multi-platform tool, there are uh, different companies which are using it already on uh, different operating systems. So for example, FreeBSD, Solaris, and so on, okay? Yep. So the new uh, cloud init takes into consideration, of course, this layers, let's say, of abstraction over the operating system while taking all the good is coming from cloud init and cloud based init. Um, at the same time, and making a new project, which is dual licensed, meaning that you can choose between GPL and Apache 2, okay? It's a GPL, I believe, okay, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, because another thing is that cloud based init is Apache 2 license, so you can do whatever with you want, actually, with the code based on the license. It comes with an installer, so it's very easy. You take it, you install it, finished, okay? Um, for the new nano server, we also provide zip packages that can be used directly to deploy it also in an environment where uh, MSIs can be used. And of course, it can be also fully automated. So MSIs are basically the way, are very roughly the Microsoft equivalent of dev packages or RPMs, okay? You can consider it the atomic way of deploying your package on, uh, on, um, on Windows, okay? It can be, of course, via graphical user interface, classical next, next, finish, okay? Or it can be fully automated, for example, as part of a Puppet Manifest or whatever else, okay? It comes with um, a lot of so-called plugin modules, meaning actions that you can do on the operating system. The most common are users in group management, storage, for example, when you boot your instance, maybe you have an, an image which is, I don't know, 10 gigabyte, and you have actually an image of flavor which requires 20 of disk, so it will automatically expand the disk uh, to reach that, uh, that size, okay? It handles WinRM. WinRM is basically the equivalent of OpenSSH in Microsoft context, okay? So it takes care of creating a listener so you can directly use um, um, HTTPS to manage your node, okay, as long as you have username and password. And also, it allows passwordless authentication by using X509 certificates. So now, since Kilo, you can create key pairs which can be either SSH keepers or X509 keepers, okay? And for Windows machines, you can use those to have a passwordless authentication. Very useful for automation, for example. No? Licensing, it takes care of, um, of um, activating automatically your instance, okay? User data, that's most probably the most important part here. You can run any PowerShell script as part of user data, so whatever action you need to do on, uh, on the machine, can be done via PowerShell, or we support also heat templates, okay? And we have also a pretty big collection of heat templates, both open source, um, available on the, directly on the upstream OpenStack um, uh, heat templates project, okay? Or as part of um, our commercial offers, okay? So we offer, we cover basically all the um, Microsoft related workloads from this perspective. Uh, and then there are a, a ton of other uh, plugin models, for example, setting the MTU, very important if you're using GRE or tunneling, which requires you to have a, um, a specific MTU size, otherwise you won't be able to, to, to handle, say, the fragmentation at the um, open switch level, and so on, NTP to set um, uh, the proper clock, or your local scripts, and a lot more. Very important, we don't support only OpenStack, we support, well, in OpenStack, of course, OpenStack HTTP, config drive. Recently, we added also support for config drive in Ironic, meaning that you can do a bare metal deployment and have config drive, you know, deployed as part, uh, let's say, as a, um, as a partition inside of, um, of your disk, okay, of your target disk. Amazon EC2, CloudStack, Open Nebula, Ubuntu Mass, which is one of our favorite uh, bare metal deployment solutions and so on, okay? You can also specify multiple of them, so which means that cloud-based init will simply try one after the other until it finds the right one. So you can have a mean, an image that will simply work on every possible type of cloud, okay? 
Now, which supported Windows versions can you use with uh, the OpenStack technology that we have today, right? Uh, from a Windows client perspective, that's Windows 7, 8, 8.1, 10, and both x86 and x64. Uh, we forgot to put Windows Vista. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> x86 and x64. <laughs> Sorry, you're going to kill me here. You know, Windows Server, all the current platforms, 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2, x64. Uh, Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview, uh, Nano Server 2016, and uh, XP in 2003 uh, yeah. also function with CloudNet. I'm adding also a small thing on this. For um, Nano Server 2016, fully supports Python 3. So we did a lot of work to make sure that Python was working on Nano. And uh, which means also that Cloud-based init and the future Cloud init will work seamlessly on Python 2.7 Python or Python 3. All right. Now, uh, SSH equivalent. In Windows today, we use what's called uh, WinRM and WSMAN to remotely manage that box. It allows us to essentially control over HTTP, HTTPS. Um, it can be used to execute PowerShell, uh, and we can actually run commands directly from Linux. So we have, uh, we can install those tools on Linux and then use, uh, basically use it as a starting point for automation to automate our Windows hosts. And if you want to see some configuration examples of that, we have some scripts available on the cloud-based GitHub repository site. Mm -hmm. We have uh, evaluation images. Anybody try to download evaluation images? Okay, good. Nice. Okay. Uh, we hear some complaints, of course, that uh, the download might be a bit slow. The, the main issue is that those images are like six gigabytes in size, okay? So make sure that when you start the download, uh, either use a, a browser that will enable you to, to retry, let's say, the download and not restart from zero, okay? Or make sure to keep, sure, to keep open also your session, okay? Because in the, the in order to download those images, you need to accept a license. So we cannot just provide you the direct link. You need first to access the license. At that point, you get a session cookie with a token. And with that token, we can download the image. What we're planning to do is to add also a common line tool, which will basically do the same thing. The limitation with the license is simply due to the fact that Microsoft, uh, in order to allowing us to let you download those images, is requiring that you accept that license, OK? Um, we are, I believe, the only company ever most probably. Yep, pretty much. That now this mm. happened, I believe mm. it was in Portland that yeah, we yeah. did that work. Yeah, uh, it, essentially, that was the first Windows Cloud appliance okay. that I know of. So, okay. And it was fully baked for OpenStack. Okay. It comes also complete with our beautiful logo. Here's the author, by the way. <laughs> okay, how to build an image? Obviously, those are test images, okay? We provide to our customers, of course, uh, as a service, uh, uh, pre-built OpenStack images, tested with continuous integration, and um, uh, updated every month with updates and so on. But we also want to make sure that the community can just rebuild the images with the same identical tools that we use, OK? Um, here is the repository where you can just download the tools. It will automatically create the image for you, OK? There is an offline creation, and then it will um, boot um, a VM in order to run and download all the Windows updates and so on. So open source, you can just look on the slide deck actually for downloading, OK? And well, now the hot topic. Now, so licensing, OK? Mm -hmm. From a licensing perspective with Windows, you have to utilize one of our existing licensing models, right? So from that standpoint, if you already have existing Windows licenses that you're consuming, those licenses can be used with OpenStack. OK, if you're doing a, a greenfield deployment, right, then you can use uh, either, you know, any of our current licensing models, so volume licensing, uh, SPLA if you're a service provider, right? Uh, but essentially what it comes down to is your, your best opportunity to get the most out of it is, is essentially with uh, using the data center SKUs. And, and uh, essentially what that does is it gives you unlimited guest access on top of that hypervisor, right? So what that means is, and from guests, we're strictly talking about Windows guests. The only time Microsoft charges you for that, you know, is, is when you're consuming Windows on Windows, right? Because we give away Hyper-V server for free. You can take that today and build an OpenStack deployment off of that and run any other operating system on it other than Windows without getting charged by Microsoft, OK? So, what we have, and, and this touches a little bit on the, on the Vert.io uh, piece earlier, if you want to run Windows on a 
platform other than Hyper-V with an open stack, we require you to use it in a supported configuration, right? So what that means is you need to have a para-virtualized device driver layer, right? In which is certified by Microsoft. Today, there are currently only three uh, certified device driver layers there that operate for Windows on KVM, okay? In order to obtain those, you need to purchase them from your enterprise Linux vendor. Okay, so what that means is you need to run supported Ubuntu from Canonical, you need to run RHEL from Red Hat, and you need to, or it needs to be SUSE Enterprise with each of their own respective Vert.io driver layer. If you use the upstream Fedora uh, Paravert layer for Windows, you will not get support for that Windows guest from Microsoft because it is currently an uncertified solution. So we highly recommend that you work with your cert you know, a, a certified Linux vendor to obtain the appropriate license if you want to get prop your, you know, proper support from Microsoft. Okay? So obviously VMware fits in there with VMware tools, but from a KVM perspective only, you need to be sh aware of the power virtualized device driver layer you're using on Windows if you want to get appropriate support. So we get a lot of questions, does Microsoft support OpenStack? Well, the answer to that is actually yes, right? Yeah. So, and, and we do support it in the way that, uh, in the following ways, right? So if you decide to use Hyper-V with, uh, you know, a, a supported version of Windows with Hyper-V and you want to put any virtual machine on that, we will support you regardless of the management platform as long as you're in a certified configuration. So feel free to use it. Um, any supported licensing model there works. So if you're, you know, have valid licenses, all that stuff is, uh, you know, kosher and you should have no issue uh, obtaining support from Microsoft. If you are running Windows in a supported configuration and have, and are for some reason having any problems, you can email that email address and I will assure you that someone will respond and help you uh, figure out um, what you need to do to get a supported version of Windows. Or if you have questions also regarding any of this stuff that we just recently discussed, you can email that and we will make sure that you get your questions answered. Okay. Okay, now let's move to the next level. So, okay, everybody likes to deploy the virtual machines on a, on a cloud, so infrastructure or services obviously are mandatory layer, okay, if you want to deploy anything useful, but okay, you don't usually present your customer just a virtual machine. You, what the customer usually wants is to have uh, some, something running on top of it, okay, some service, some applications, and whatever, okay. So we support a variety of options from this perspective. One of them is HIT. HIT is, of course, the orchestration project in OpenStack, so we have fully support for that. And we have a big lot of templates. I mean, Active Directory, Exchange, uh, SharePoint, SQL Server, IIS, Windows failover clustering, uh, SQL Server also always on with, um, with failover clustering and so on, okay? So all these things are uh, fully automated. So all these activities that traditionally were requiring a sysadmin days to deploy now are fully automated and are deployed in a, in a matter of minutes or maximum hours, okay? Including entirely cluster configurations. Once again, so that's in a purely OpenStack native user experience. Yeah. Can be virtual, can be physical, I mean bare metal, containers and so on. Well, we'll talk later about containers and so on. Um, okay, Windows OpenStack components. As I was saying before, we are active on a very large number of projects. So we have, of course, Hyper-V computer driver. I mean, the, the Hyper-V driver is our darling, meaning that it's the first project we started working on since Folsom, okay? And obviously this one uh, is a very mature project and so on. So speak for yourself. <laughs> 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 the project of me. Well, I, I started on okay. Cactus, so. <laughs> so, um, um, the main idea is that people sometimes ask, hey, what's the status of the support for that project and everything? Because, you know, usually you hear about, um, I don't know, all, all the KVM stuff backed by Red Hat or Canonical or other big names in the, in the Linux world. Then you say you hear VMware backing their project, but you don't hear Microsoft backing the, 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 um, uh, the corresponding Hyper-V driver, okay? Um, 
we as cloud-based solutions are maintaining very actively together of course with the community this driver and i can guarantee that it's very high in terms of quality okay so the fact that there is or not microsoft pushing behind it has nothing to do with the quality or the level of maturity or feature completeness of the project okay we are definitely willing to hear your opinion we're willing to um to ask uh, or let's say answer any of your questions and either of course through the openstack uh, at microsoft.com yep. email alias or of course our booth or whatever else okay? irc any of those uh, things yeah. yep. next the neutron agent of course there is no compute without networking so we have the hyper vsdn support and also open v switch more on this later we have cinder support we have actually uh, three drivers two of them on windows iSCSI support and uh, smb3 uh, manila is actually fresh from liberty so we have a uh, um, a, a new project, a new, a new driver which, which merged actually in Liberty. I'm talking about all, all this stuff is upstream in the, in, in the core of the stack projects, okay? Uh, well, of course, we have a Windows Cloud in it, which is a cl cloud based in it. Uh, we have um, an agent for for Silometer, okay? And uh, also very important, since in, 2000, in Windows Server 2016, there is going to be support, actually, it's already available in the preview for containers. We have also Nova Docker support today. Okay, this is actually merging currently. I mean, it's up for review in Nova Docker. And we are working now on Magnum in order to have full support in Magnum also for Windows containers. Okay, so this will be available by the time in which Windows Server 2016 will be released. Okay. Um, so once again, those are all <laughs> native open stack, open mm. stack experiences mm. in which we're integrating the, the key Windows technologies mm. such that you can use Windows technologies in your OpenStack deployment today. Okay. Okay. You would like nope. to introduce um, sure. Hyper-V? So, Hyper-V, what is it? It's Microsoft's flagship hypervisor. Uh, its setup is pretty easy. Um, our Nova driver is in its seventh release. Uh, actually, it's, well, since working with CloudBase, it's in its mm. seventh release. Well, in uh, Nexus, it was out, so. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, so essentially, we have support in it for Hyper-V, uh, the Hyper-V releases that are included with the 2012, 2012 R2, and 2016 releases. Uh, we have VHD, VHDX support, Solomon support, and there's lots more uh, killer features that we include. So Hyper-V server is our free edition, similar to ESXi, I guess. Mm, yep. um, it's the full hypervisor platform. So there is nothing that... Uh, let, let's say that we include all the features and functions available to run a full hypervisor stack uh, within that product, okay? You can take it today and have, this, have all the same bits that you would have in a full Windows server uh, hypervisor-wise, right? It's a stripped down uh, Windows core experience, so you get the you know, reduced footprint. Um, and if you decide to use it, you will need to only license your Windows guests. Right. Making a comparison with ASXi, so ASXi has some caps, let's say, in the amount of resources you can use, and to uh, use fully ASXi, you need to use vSphere, right? Hyper-V is different, meaning that you have everything you need in Hyper-V itself, okay? So it just works, it's free, out of the box, no limitations, exact same features that you can have on the Windows Server right. counterpart. Now, if you have a Windows Server media standing around and you want to try this, all you need to do is enable the Hyper-V role. Mm -hmm. feature, right? And with, same with Windows 8.1 and Windows 10. Uh, you can use those for your uh, OpenStack workstation development, right? Uh, station, so. Okay, then of course on top of Hyper-V, you just deploy the Hyper-V Nova Compute, which comes again with an MSI as we will see pretty soon. Uh, seamless OpenStack experience, just like on Linux. Again, it's the same concept. Only Python code, so in the moment in which you look at the traces, you look at the logs and everything, it's the same identical type of logs that you will see on Linux, okay? Uh, it's the same identical Nova compute that you will see running on a KVM box, okay? Um, um, it ca uses, of course, key features baked into the Hyper-V. So we have a driver which runs inside of Nova compute, and that's actually the Hyper-V driver. Some key differentiators, I mean, of course, hypervisors today are commoditized, meaning that, you know, you can take a KVM, you can take an SSI, you can take a Hyper-V, you know, they do more or less the same thing, but there are still some difference. I mean, uh, some of them are stronger than others on uh, some specific aspects, right? Um, for example, Hyper-V has a share nothing live migration out of the box. You take two Hyper-V boxes, you have live migration, okay? So Nova live migrate, it just works, period. 
Remote effects, so if you want to have VDI, you have baked in in Hyper-V, and thanks to our driver also exposed to, to OpenStack, um, you have uh, um, um, uh, GPU acceleration. So you can have all these features as part of your Windows guests, so for example, if you have VDI, so if you give to your users access to virtual machines for desktop usage, okay? Shielded VMs is a new thing coming in 2016. It's a security feature that actually allows you to uh, guarantee to your users that even in case of uh, attempts to taint, let's say, the hypervisor itself, your VMs will always be safe. The way in which shielded VMs work, it's a pretty complex and long uh, discussion that could take, let's say, one, one entire hour, one entire session to discuss it. But it's an amazing feature, okay? It comes, actually, it's based on the so-called user resolution mode, which comes with uh, Windows 10, okay? Which is something that will change radically the way in which about we think about malware today. Um, it's a 2016 feature, so meaning you can take the technical preview today and try it out. But it will be available in RTM, of course, next year. And storage spaces direct, uh, which are used for hyperconvergence, meaning that you can have a um, shared nothing storage, meaning distributed across multiple nodes, like you will do with ClusterFS, Ceph, and so on, in which you can have, um, as we will see pretty soon, um, every single node which has compute storage networking uh, on, on, on every node, so you don't have the rows distributed across uh, separated nodes in your network. Now, continuous integration, right? One of the key aspects of OpenStack. Hyper-V is fully CI tested uh, with Tempest, and we report upstream to Garrett, okay? We are one of the largest CI contributors uh, today and have been uh, since we stood up the continuous integration infrastructure. We started with Nova, right? We also have uh, CI for Neutron, uh, both with the Hyper-V native virtual switch as well as uh, we're currently working to enable our OVS driver in the CI as well. Okay, we, we also uh, have downstream testing for those components because we have, in some cases, code that's waiting uh, in the, um, the pipeline to get integrated into the upstream release. Uh, those two projects are the networking Hyper-V and compute Hyper-V. Okay, and those uh, upstream projects will, or downstream projects will actually, uh, in most cases, contain all the integrations that uh, we have uh, sort of waiting to get in the upstream tree. Um, we also maintain and run CI for Cinder. Okay, that's uh, Cinder with uh, iSCSI targets on a Windows server, as well as SMB3 uh, targets, all right? And uh, SMB3 connectivity uh, to Linux as well, because Linux, uh, and the, well, essentially the Sama team has done a tremendous amount of work to enable the SMB3 protocols. Um, in Sama, and also Manila, both Linux and Windows guests, okay? So I believe we are most probably the only company with so many CIs running at the same time. I mean, it's uh, quite I don't know, I, I find it quite amazing mm. sometimes that okay. we've gotten this far. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's move to Neutron. So, um, of course, we have the Neutron plugin part of uh, the project since 2013 for Hyper-V, back in the days in which it was called Quantum since Havana. We support VLAN and VGRE, flat networking, and local network on this specific plugin. Um, it's a plugin agent model. The cool idea is that it works um, as an ML2 plugin agent, which means that you can have the ML2 plugin and as many agents as you want, including, for example, OpenVSwitch. This is a typical Di network diagram that you will have, like so, exactly like for every other type of OpenStack deployment, you will have a, um, uh, you will have some controllers, you will have a networking nodes, and you will have compute nodes. Okay, in the new hyperconverged model, we have also distributed rounding, meaning that the networking node and the compute node merge. Okay. Okay, OVS interop. So the ML2 mechanism driver that we have is compatible with OpenVSwitch, meaning that you can have one KVM node running OpenV switch, one Hyper-V node running the native networking stack, and they will just work together seamlessly. For example, if your tenant has one Linux machine and one Windows machine, the two of them will talk among each other over, for example, a Neutron tunnel, okay? So one very important thing that we did from the beginning from a design perspective was that we wanted to be sure that you were able to take the Hyper-V box, uh, put it in an existing OpenStack network, with, for example, KVM or whatever else, and make it just work seamlessly. 
And this goes exactly in that direction. Um, we support, of course, the type of networks we were talking about before. And we just use the level layer 3 DHCP firewall and so on agent that come directly with uh, OVS, okay, and most important with Neutron. Next, that was not enough. So, of course, most of our customers were happy, but some of them were asking, hey, I want to have also OVSDB. I need open flows. I need uh, open daylight compatibility. Uh, in short, they needed OpenV switch. So we said, okay, let's move uh, down to the hardware level, or better said, to the kernel level, and let's port OpenV switch to Windows. Okay? So we did this very, very cool porting work, and now we have OpenV switch working natively on Hyper-V. This is actually a work that we did together with VMware, okay? So that was a very nice community work. And all the code that we uh, contributed, the entire project, is currently available as part of the OVS project upstream, okay? Um, great interoperability, support for all the type of tunnels that you will expect with OpenV switch, so VXLAN, GRE, STT, and so on. There is some Geneve porting in process as well. Again, Neutron ML2 and OVS agent. So the same agent that you run on Linux works exactly as is on Windows. Uh, and most important, is compatible with OpenDaylight and NSX because we support also OVSDB, the OVSDB protocol. So even if you don't run an agent locally on the Hyper-V box, okay, it will just work because the OVSDB will, is available to the network, to the management network. Cinder. So Cinder, Cinder, we have an iSCSI Windows driver, basically utilizes uh, the existing iSCSI infrastructure, exporting VHDs today. I believe in 2016 we'll be able to do raw block devices. Uh, does SMB, sorry, that's all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, open. Keep on going, keep on uh, going. Keep on going. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where you left me off. All right, yeah, so we, we, uh, we, it also does SMB3 and SOFS uh, Windows File Server Driver. It's a great companion for Hyper-V. It basically allows us to do uh, TCP offloading of that transport layer. So SM, S, don't think of SMB3 as, you know, your old school SIFs or SMB. It's, it's used at, by Microsoft as a, as a high-speed data transfer layer for uh, remote disk-based activity. And it can be used with any hypervisor. Okay, with Manila, same thing. We enable the SMB3 driver in there for both Linux and Windows guests, and that basically allows uh, Windows file services um, to be exposed to guests through APIs. Dashboard integration. So obviously, Horizon can be used with Hyper-V as well. Okay? Uh, there is one small difference. Uh, all the other hypervisors use VNC as their technology for accessing the console of your uh, guests, okay, while we use RDP. Um, in order to do that, we have a, a project which we contribute. We are currently the maintainers of the free, v free RDP Web Connect project, uh, which consists uh, in an um, HTML5 layer which connects via web sockets to a service, and this service will connect via RDP to the Hyper-V host, okay? We are not talking about RDP to connect inside of the guest, but it's used to connect directly to the host, meaning Hyper-V, and that one will um, redirect the, con the access to the console, meaning that that's what you use also, for example, for accessing a Linux guest running on Hyper-V itself. Okay? Um, in short, it just works. So our goal was to make, again, a seamless experience, so what you get with VNC is what you get also with RDP. You just have this additional component to install. So Nova, of course, has a installer. So if you don't want to automate it with Chef, Puppet, and so on, as we'll see in a second, you can just run it, and it will guide you, asking you all the relevant information. For, for example, where is your Keystone? Where is your Glance API? Uh, where is your MQP service, Rabbit in this case? Uh, uh, where do you want to put your instances and stuff like that? Okay. So you just fill up this information, and then at the end you will have an installed and a deployed node. Or you can use. DevOps tools, mm. right? Mm. Today we know there's a rich ecosystem of, of DevOps tools available for operating system mm. platforms, right? You can use those, uh, you know, especially Puppet, Chef, Salt, we know all work well with Windows, right? All those communities have put in a substantial effort to help embrace DevOps automation with Windows using their technology, and uh, we use some of it today in our CI Kay. as well. How many of you are using Puppet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Chef? 
Okay. Juju? Okay. Good. Salt? Salt. <laughs> Ansible? Oh. Okay. Good. I like it. There is a pretty good yeah, distribution. Good, right? good mix. Okay. Okay. Nano. So, Nano Server. Welcome to the next generation of Windows Server. We're going to reinvent your Windows experience with Nano Server. What it is, it's a micro version of Windows. What, about 400 meg, right, Alex? Yeah. It's lightweight. It could be pixie booted. It's Windows without Windows. So, not Windows Core, Windows without Windows. It's a <laughs> console. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Once again, extremely, fall foot, extremely small footprint, extremely fast to deploy, and it's included as part of Windows 2016. It has Hyper-V on board, storage, and whatever else, including also Storage Spaces Direct. Yep. Now, Storage Spaces Direct is sort of uh, uh, our implementation of a distributed file system or, or a distributed block storage system that can be shared as a, well, like a shared storage between all the nodes for converged mm -hmm. purposes, right? Uh, we can build uh, scale-out file services with it um, and then use those file services, uh, as we said, with Cinder um, and Manila. Okay, so let's put all these things together and we get the OpenStack hyper-converged based on Hyper-V. This is something that we announced yesterday okay, here at the summit. It's brand new stuff, actually. We are definitely, so OpenStack has the first um, hyper-converged um, design ever based on Windows Server, okay? And how does it work? So you take your Hyper-V nodes, for example, for example, with Nano Server. We have a demo running at the boot, by the way, so if you want to come at our boot 32 and take a look at it, you will see it. Each of those nodes has um, Hyper-V, okay, so for the compute part, networking, and of course storage, okay? So all the disk, the local disk, so your regular out-of-the-box commodity uh, SAS or SATA disk, SSD or regular hard disk, mechanical hard disks, okay, can be used for this type of pooling. So nothing expensive. So finally we get rid of all these costs that a, a SAN will imply and everything. Um, the storage is distributed, meaning that thanks to Storage Spaces Direct, uh, all those disks form a single pool, or multiple pools, depending on how you want to distribute them, okay? And um, on top of those pools you can create volumes, in which data is mirrored, depending on the type of fault tolerant settings that you want, and striped across all those machines. So the result is that at any time you can just take out one of the machines, so s let's say that it dies for any reasons, and everything will keep on working. What happens, of course, is that you will have some dedicated networking in order to have uh, the data transferring across the nodes and synchronizing, okay? So to make sure that everything keeps on working. Um, the good part is that this works also together with the SMB Direct or NDMA, so you have a harder offloading on uh, the most, uh, let's say, used type of NICs in, the, in, the in, uh, in the modern infrastructures today, so that actually you don't have to have CPU cycles or many CPU cycles dedicated to this. So this is the same technology that Microsoft is using also, so it comes with a platform and it will use also another type of clouds, okay, we use it here in OpenStack. Uh, on top of it, um, we can use Cinder, for example, with uh, Scale-Out File Server, which is a clustering application that will use SMB3 features to make sure that you have full fault tolerance and balancing across those nodes for the, um, um, for the host and guest and so on that will actually use the Cinder services on top of it. Plus, of course, Hyper-V. You take out one node automatically. Let's say that you one node dies. You can just pull off the power, okay? What happens is that the storage will keep on working, so you will lose not anything from your volumes. And at the same time, the machine will simply be responded the line migrated to one of the other nodes, okay? So simple, easy, automated, full tolerant and everything. Full support if you want, even from cattle and not only for, for sorry, for pets and not only for cattle. Next thing, Juju. We are, a big, we are big fans of Juju. Actually, I believe it's the easiest way to deploy today um, um, workloads on top, for example, an OpenStack cloud, and very important, it's, um, um, it works on Linux, it works on Windows, and we have a ton of cloud-based Windows charms, okay, from Active Directory, Hyper-V, of course, Exchange, SharePoint, um, Windows File Server, SQL Server, SQL Server always on, VDI, failover clustering, uh, Skype for Business, actually, that's something we're going to 
to be released pretty soon and so on. Um, and that's it. If you want to try the charms, just let me know. There is Will behind there somewhere, which can, to which we can ask any type of questions. We are more than happy to give you trial versions or whatever. Plus, we have also open source charms freely available. If you want to try OpenStack on Hyper-V, all you have to do is to use Vimagine, which is a tool that we developed for a proof of concept. Because the usual complaint that we hear from users, so especially for newcomers to the OpenStack community, is how difficult it is to deploy OpenStack. We said, why? And we created a tool in which just with a couple of clicks, you can uh, deploy the entire OpenStack on anything starting from your laptop. Let's say that you have a laptop with Windows 8, 8 8.1, or 10 running Hyper-V, then you get OpenStack running there entirely. So your laptop will be the compute node, and you will have a virtual machine running the remaining Linux components, okay? And it just works. So no hassle in understanding how op OpenStack works. You can just deploy it, use it, and then once you understand how it works, you can think about how to do a deployment at scale, okay? We are adding also support now for the nano hyperconverged support that we were talking about. Freely available on our site, just download it, use it, and so on. Next. Now, if you have support questions or questions regarding OpenStack, uh, please feel free to email OpenStack at Microsoft or look at ask.cloudbase.it uh, mm -hmm. uh, for information regarding that. Okay, we got to the Q&A part. Any question? Okay. Yep. Thanks, Thanks gentlemen over there. Thank you. For the licensing of uh, Microsoft guests on Hyper-V, can we use our existing SPLA agreement so we still license per socket? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. In fact, I, I believe that's the probably for large-scale deployments that's the best yeah, license. For public, the cloud most appropriate. Is, for public cloud is the way to go because you are needing to license actually to their parties. Yeah, or even if you have like multi-tenant scenarios, okay. that's the best. Mm -hmm. Next question. Over there. Uh, thank you. Uh, for remote effects, have you tried running benchmarks on the instances running in the cloud? Yeah, we have some benchmarks. Uh, we were actually going to publish them pretty soon. We were evaluating them today. <laughs> uh, okay. So if you want to come to the booth, we can talk about it. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. More questions? Wow. No questions? Wow, I figured really? there'd be more don't than be that, Alessandro. Yeah, don't be shy. Come on. Over there, over there. Did we cover? Oh, no, we didn't cover deploying on Ironic, did we? Oh, no, damn it. Oh, so we, yeah. we also, sorry, guys. We, we, slipped, we missed a slide. <laughs> yeah. We support deploying on Ironic. And also, since we're talking about it, uh, we have a manga that we release for this number. And on the last page, we have a tribute to Ironic. Okay, since it's metal as a service, you see the guy here with the horns and so on. <laughs> so, yeah, we yeah. actually have full support for Ironic okay. as well. Yeah, and it's actually also mass and ironic are two uh, preferred uh, way of deployment bare metal. And in cloud-based init, we added also ironic support. As a, uh, we talked actually about this Now, before. actually, mm. additionally, and, and let's mm. not be short on this, mm. uh, CloudBase also added support for Microsoft's cloud server. Correct. How many people here knew that Microsoft was a contributor to the uh, OCS, Open Compute? Wow. So thank you. Mm. <laughs> So yeah, so basically they added Ironic support for Microsoft's Open Compute Platform, uh, both in Ironic and in MAS, correct? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you can deploy user Ironic to deploy on the Open Compute Platform, which is actually a, a great platform. Um, other questions? Yep. Here in front. Uh, Just a second for the audio device to arrive. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you support um, uh, Horizon, right? Yeah. And um, what about Service Manager? Uh, what service uh, manager? Contest. The, the, the uh, virtual machine manager. Oh, okay, so oh, hold oh, on oh. a second. Let's talk for a moment about this. In terms of OpenStack technology that works uh, with Windows, we're talking about Windows, the core platform. We're not talking about any of our management platforms. Uh, those are different type of deployment, right? They're apples and oranges. So from that perspective, they're mutually exclusive. If you were to deploy them together, you would essentially have two different uh, management solutions running on the same infrastructure that were completely independent, right? So from that perspective, you know, Microsoft has a specific target audience for, uh, you know, their SCVV SCVMM deployments mm -hmm. and such. Uh, they're typically, you know, highly available, those things, you know, the, it's 
those deployments that require HA at the hypervisor level and those sort of things, right? OpenStack's a different model of deployment, right? We, I like to think of it like we like, you know, OpenStack loves toasters. We have a compute toaster, a storage toaster and such, and a hyperconverged toaster yeah. now. So from that perspective, the, the, the model at which is different and from a early on perspective, we need to just focus on enabling Windows hypervisors in OpenStack. So, yeah, there's no overlap between what happens in SCVMM and, and that. It, SCVMM it might be able to be deployed on top, but we haven't done any work in that space with the OpenStack group. We, we are open. Let's say if there are customer requirements or something that we never say no to, but you can see like the, 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 the platforms or the Windows operating system, Hyper-V and so on, as the basis, and then you have a variety of management stacks on top. One of them is VMM, one other is OpenStack, and there are some, some others, okay? So that, that's the main idea. So, but all the features are available in the platform so that these management stacks can consume it. There is nothing in VMM that is not available in OpenStack from this perspective because they're both consuming the underlying Yeah, the, the same core features, right? Okay. So from, once again, from that perspective, our goal, primary goal was to take those features that we think are great in Windows and allow OpenStack users that want to use Windows in their OpenStack deployment to get access to those okay. features. Okay, guys, we are at the end of the session. If you have any other questions, please come by to our booth or we will be outside here willing to talk with, with you to on any question. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.